That social and cultural context is valuable background. In the foreground is the invaluable impact of the good news of God's kingdom that collides with powers and principalities in a social invasion and a revolution. The kingdom of God is a key category. Let's look at some of the places in 1 Corinthians where the term peeks through. Again, it's another tip of an iceberg that is fundamental for Paul's thinking. In chapter 4, starting with 19, Paul tells his audience, I will come to you soon, if the Lord wills, and I will find out not the talk of these arrogant people, but their power. For the kingdom of God does not consist in mere talk, but in power. So the powerful kingdom of God is at work in and among the Corinthians and through Paul's ministry. In chapter 6, as Paul is examining the Corinthians' behavior, he says this in verse 9, Do you not know? Here's one of those, don't you know? Compared to the Thessalonians, you know, you know this. Don't you know that the unrighteous won't inherit the kingdom of God? As an aside, Christians for a long time have basically talked about behavior as a matter of will it take you to heaven or will it send you to hell? Not only is that bad theology of what role works play, it's also not how Paul frames behaviors. He frames the consequences of our behavior as being worthy heirs of the kingdom or being disinherited because unworthy. That implies a very different future not a kind of paradise that we just enter into to chill for eternity or a lake of fire that we're thrown into to be tormented for eternity. It implies a realm of life and activity, a kingdom, in which we can take roles if we're suited to them, if we've received the remaking grace with faith and been built up to be worthy heirs. That's a very different framework for understanding even morality and immorality, as well as understanding the role of faith and grace. In chapter 15, where Paul discusses Jesus' resurrection and its consequences, verse 22, For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. First Christ, the first fruits, he rose on the first Easter. Then at his coming, at his parousia, those who belong to Christ will rise. And then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and every power. These are the principalities and powers that I was describing. He's going to deliver the old ones from Corinth in the first century and the newer ones from the 21st century and all other centuries' principalities and powers. Christ will deliver to the Father. Later in that chapter, I tell you this, brothers and sisters, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Why would you hand over something imperishable to people who aren't going to last anyway? So God is about transforming what's perishable and turning it into what's imperishable so that we can inherit this kingdom. Again, another distinction between popular notions of Christianity where Judgment Day is a kind of retirement party where we go to relax forever or just go into a permanent worship service versus inheriting the kingdom and a life of activity. Even in just the tips of that iceberg that emerge in this little letter, you see the kingdom as a realm of power that's operative in the present. You see it as a future inheritance, and you see God's churches in Corinth and everywhere else as communities where God is building people up to become heirs, transformed and suited to inherit that imperishable kingdom and rule and reign forever. That's a very different world arriving to the world that it's arriving in. The gospel is a collision between old and new. And 1st and 2nd Corinthians are mid-collision snapshots where we see some of the messiness of that invasion of the kingdom into the Greco-Roman world of Corinth and the powers and principalities kind of duking it out, not just with each other, which they often do anyway, but especially with the new creation that's happening as the gospel enters this context of Corinth and begins to do its work. And that place becomes a theater of spiritual warfare between the powers and principalities and the God who reigns above them and to whom they will all be subjected at Christ's coming. To describe Paul's role in all this, I wanna give you an analogy of a renovation of a fire damaged building. 
Here's a sad image of a fire damaged building. It's the San Gabriel Mission in Southern California, not far from here. The church burned about six months ago. And as you can see, some things lasted and some things didn't. In chapter three, Paul uses an illustration which applies really to the book as a whole. He's addressing the divisions in the church where people in the church have taken sides. They have favorite apostles and the apostles command their loyalties. That would make apostles principalities and powers too, right? So Paul is undermining that by saying, no, we're all doing the same work. We're all agents of the same Lord. Verse five, what is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So the one who plants, nor the one who waters, neither is anything, but only God who gives the growth. Skipping down to verse nine, for we are God's fellow workers and y'all are God's field or God's building. The Corinthians are a building whom God is building. This is why building one another up is such a priority all through the Corinthian letters because that is cooperating with what God is up to. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation. Well, what's the foundation? The gospel is the foundation. And someone else is now building on it, actually a lot of people. Well, let each one take care how he or she builds upon it. No one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. That's a wonderful observation. The only real foundation is the one that none of us laid. Jesus laid that foundation. He is the rock on which we build, to quote Matthew. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, on the one hand, those last, or wood, hay, straw, those burn, those don't last, each one's work will become manifest because the day, judgment day, will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, that worker will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, the worker will suffer loss safe, but only as a refugee through fire. So consider how this metaphor plays out. The Corinthian church, the Corinthian congregation is God's building, and this building is on fire. It's on fire and experiencing a taste of the judgment that will finally happen at the end. Paul actually talks about judgment this way as coming in the present moment when he addresses the abuses that are happening around the Lord's Supper. In chapter 11, 26, For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So whoever eats the bread or drinks of the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let someone examine himself or herself then, and so in that way eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body and we'll go into what this means, but really it means regarding the whole body of the congregation of which I and everyone else is merely a member. Anyone who eats and drinks narrowly, selfishly, without discerning the whole body that God is building, eats and drinks judgment. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have even died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we wouldn't be judged. In other words, if we discerned the reality and lived according to it, then we wouldn't experience the fire that's burning us down. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined, not so that we'll be ruined, but so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So the fire in Corinth can actually refine. It can expose what lasts those stone walls of the mission that are surviving and what can't last, the wood of the pews and the roof. Those are the works that don't have what it takes to survive the fire of God's judgment. I'll finish the passage in verse 33. So, brothers and sisters, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, eat at home, so that when you do come together, it won't be for judgment. It won't lead to fire. So the Corinthian church has experienced some of God's judgment on its failures, which are tearing it apart and which are confusing it and which are weakening it. And Paul is trying to renovate this fire damaged building. That is what first and second Corinthians are. Paul's attempts to renovate this damaged building and build it back up the way God intends.
Paul and Sosthenes and Timothy and the other workers are doing this renovation by proclaiming and teaching two things above all, the cross and the kingdom of God. Paul puts this right up front, addressing the problem of division and schism within this little community. He says, I didn't come to baptize. I didn't come to give you something to take sides over. I came preaching the cross, preaching the gospel, Christ crucified. Verse 23, we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. So the cross is the centerpiece of Paul's message, not just because it's how our sins are paid for, but because it's the way that we are remade. It's that foundation on which everything is built. For a picture of this, I want to direct you to the Bible Project videos, which are assigned as part of this class. In many of the posters, you will see this symbolic representation of the gospel, a cross, an equal sign, and a crown. And that is the cartoon shorthand for Christ is Lord, Jesus Christ is Lord, which is the fundamental confession of the Christian church. This is a great little logo. You could just as well translate this logo, the cross is the kingdom. The cross is how the kingdom arrives. So while I'm distinguishing the kingdom from the cross as two messages, they're really not two different messages. That's why I appreciate this equal sign that the Bible Project has chosen to use. If I take these images and flip them, I get the kingdom is the cross. The manner of this Lord Jesus is cruciform, cross-shaped. We are called as subjects of his kingdom to take on his cross and follow him. So you've seen the cross, you've seen the death of Christ set right up front in chapter one, and you've seen him highlight it in describing the Lord's Supper in which we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And I've shown you references to the kingdom of God scattered through 1 Corinthians, always obscure, sort of in the background, but operative, in fact, determinative for the lives of Christians. This is the foundation that we build on. And this is also the manner of our building. This is familiar ground if you've already looked at how the book of Acts represents Paul's apostolic ministry. Back in Acts 14, on his way to Corinth, he hasn't come there yet. That's going to be chapter 18. At the end of verse 21, in Antioch, Paul was exhorting the disciples to continue in the faith and that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. Acts 18.11, Paul continued in Corinth a year and six months teaching the word of God among the Corinthians. This arouses pushback, the kind of pushback I described from the principalities and powers, even the good ones. The Jewish leaders there went to the deputy of Achaia, Gallio, and said, This fellow, Paul, persuades people to worship God contrary to our Torah. After Paul leaves Corinth, he goes to Ephesus in chapter 19. He entered the synagogue in Ephesus and for three months spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading the Jews there about the kingdom of God. And finally, the last verses of the book of Acts, where Paul reaches Rome. He lived there two whole years at his own expense. It sounds like Paul in the letters, doesn't it? And welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ. In both Paul's representations of his own preaching and in Luke's representations of Paul's ministry, you see the prominence of Christ's death and of the kingdom of God. Since the writer of Acts is an associate of Paul's who's been with him in a number of these contexts, I think it's fair to say that this is an accurate representation of Paul's ministry. So when you see kingdom of God language popping up in Paul's letters, you know there's an iceberg under that, and you know how important it is to his overall approach, both as a missionary and then later following up and putting out the fires that erupt in so many of his congregations as this gospel collides with the powers and principalities of our world.